Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fight Bladder Cancer webinar on living with a stoma. My name is Lydia Makaroff, and I am the Chief Executive of Fight Bladder Cancer. Fight Bladder Cancer is so thankful to all our supporters who helped make this happen. The support for this webinar is provided by the British Association of Urological Nurses, the Graham and Diane Roberts Charitable Settlement, StreamGo, Sanofi, AstraZeneca, and the National Lottery Fund. Fight Bladder Cancer retains all editorial control. We'd love to hear more about you and who is actually listening to this webinar. So we have some polls uh, that will be coming up. We're going to ask you what is your interest in this webinar and had you heard of Fight Bladder Cancer before this webinar? So please answer those polls uh, that should be available coming up on your screen soon. Fight Bladder Cancer. Our vision is a future where everyone survives bladder cancer and lives long and well. Our mission is to lead the fight against bladder cancer driven by patient and family insights. And our, fam our values are patient-led, compassionate, action-orientated and ambitious. We are a charity that helps everyone affected by bladder cancer across the UK, and we are fighting for bladder cancer, and we are fighting for you. I would like to now pass the floor to Sarah Hilary, who is the president of the British Association of Urological Nurses. She will welcome you to this webinar on living with a stoma. Hello, my name is Sarah Hilary, and I'm the president of the British Association of Urological Nurses. I'm also lead nurse for urology at York and Scarborough NHS Teaching Hospitals Foundation Trust, and I'm an advanced nurse practitioner in urology. The British Association of Urological Nurses is a professional body representing urological nurses in the UK. We promote urological nursing as a specialty. We provide education and training for urological nurses and work with other charities to improve the care of people with urological conditions. Thank you for joining us at this patient webinar on living with a stoma. Whether you have just had your stoma operation or have been living with a stoma for a few years, I'm sure you will find this webinar useful. Please remember that your nurses are here to help if you have any medical questions or concerns about your stoma, please get in touch with your local urological nurse or stoma nurse and we would be happy to assist you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm so excited to introduce three fantastic speakers to you tonight. We have Sharon Filligan, who is the nurse advisor to the Eurostomy Association and Mitro Fanoff Support. She will talk to you from her nurse perspective of what is a stoma and what is a urinary stoma. And then we will have Susan Mullerworth, one of our patient bladder cancer patient advocates who is living with a stoma. And then we will have insights from David Ritchie, who is another one of our bladder cancer patient advocates. So now we have Sharon Filligan here. Uh, she is the nurse advisor to the Eurostomy Association and Metro Fanoff Support, and she will talk to you about her experience as a nurse advisor and urinary stomas. Sharon, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. It can be extremely daunting uh, when you're told, and very scary sometimes, when you're told you've got to have your bladder removed. We know that at the moment there are limited choices uh, once you've had the bladder removed. And at the moment, there are only about three choices. Um, those choices include a near bladder with urethral drainage. This may require or not require catheterization, depending on how well you empty the bladder after it's made. These, these reconstructed bladders are made from bowel. Then the second choice is a near bladder which is drained via a Mitrofenoff channel. So it again is made by bowel, and then um, it's drained via an umbilical or a, a, an abdominal uh, stoma uh, into uh, the lavatory. And the third op uh, operation that you can be offered is the urinary conduit, which is the one that we're going to concentrate on tonight. A urinary conduit, or also new, known as an ileal conduit or a urostomy, 
is made from the last piece of the small bowel. A part of the bowel is brought to the surface in a spout. I don't know if you can see me pointing at that. Um, and uh, the other end is closed and the ureters are actually uh, sewn into the end uh, in a watertight way. This will require uh, a bag to be worn at all times. Preoperatively, um, there's a lot to uh, take on board. Citing uh, with where are you going to have this? Where, where's the most appropriate site for it to be? Where the opportunity to wear an appliance, you'll be put in touch with a nurse specialist and that nurse specialist will go through all these with you. Preoperatively also, um, there'll be various tests that have to be uh, gone through, including CT scans and urography, and you're probably well used to having a lot of these anyway. We also need to know about your renal function tests and whether uh, what your urea and your electrolytes are doing preoperatively. So these are all be taken in the preoperative phase, but you'll get the operation explained to you by your nurse specialist, the clinical nurse specialist in the hospital. A lot of hospitals don't do bowel preparation anymore, but uh, some do. And uh, to a degree, it still remains important to make sure that your bowel is quite clear preoperatively. It's also important to make sure that uh, you're actually quite well hydrated and that you've got some high energy uh, foods and drinks on board preoperatively. Um, what I would say is even though we don't do bowel preparation, it is really important to make sure that everything's nice and clear preoperatively. You don't want to be constipated when you go into this type of surgery. So here we have a, a picture of the kidneys, uh, the ureters going into the newly formed stoma. Urinary stomas are actually a relatively new pro, uh, procedure it, from the 1950s. When you think about some of the bowel stomas, they've been around since round about the Crimean War. So, so urostomies are quite, uh, quite a modern type of surgery. Once your uh, stoma is formed, you need to wear a, a pouch uh, or a, an appliance at all times, and that appliance needs to have a drainage tap to drain your urine out. Stomas are different forms, but nearly always need a spout. They are made from the ileum, and that ileum feels to touch like the skin inside your mouth. And as you can see from uh, these pictures, they've all got a little bit of a spout uh, and they are all um, they're they're all warm, pink, moist and soft. So if you feel the inside of your mouth, that's what your stoma is going to feel like. And if you notice down in the right hand corner, uh, the person usually it's sighted on the right hand side. But this person has had it sighted on the left hand side. And we sometimes uh, prefer that side for people when they're a keen golfer or they play bass guitar. Um, Postoperatively, it's really important that you again are well nourished and we will start giving you nourishing fluids as soon as possible. One of the things that's very good is to take chewing gum, sugar free chewing gum into hospital uh, and chew that 15 minutes at least four times a day. Uh, and that tends to start up gastric movement and that helps your bowels. These days with uh, enhanced recovery, we're getting you out and about as soon as possible so that uh, you can mobilize and you, you avoid things like chest infections and deep vein thrombosis. As I said before, the pouches that you use, they come in clear and opaque. And they, but the commonality between all of them is that they have a drainage tap. There are multiple types of drainage taps, um, and it's important that you get the right pouch for your dexterity to empty. As you can see from both of these pictures, that they, they've got twisting taps. 
and the twisting taps that you can have a one piece appliance or you can have a two piece appliance. And as I said before, they can either be clear so you can see the urine or they can be opaque. Particularly at night, people prefer sometimes to be attached up to a night drainage bag and then you don't really have to worry about getting up in, in the night to drain the, uh, the appliance. Um, these appliances, uh, the night drainage appliances, take at least two litres. Also, some people like to use leg bags. That's not as common as the night drainage bags, but um, it's, it's useful, particularly sometimes when people are travelling. So, what are the types of questions that people ask when they're going to, to have that stoma created? Well, we know from what I said before that we take a piece of the last part of the ileum, uh, one end is, is closed and the other one's brought to a surface. What does it look like? Pink, warm, moist and soft. How will I manage? Everybody is taught when they're in the hospital how to manage and we try to uh, send you home with a, a dedicated community nurse who will visit you at home or get you to come to the community uh, outpatient department. So there is support throughout. Will it leak? Well, we hope not. Um, one of the reasons that the doctors will, uh, the surgeons will create a spout is, is to, to help the spout going into the pouch. Everybody has different uh, allergies and different things, so we're often trying to try different types of appliances so that we make sure that there's no sensitivities to the particular appliance you're using. Will I, will I smell? No. Urine has a little bit of an odour and as you know from certain things that you eat or drink that you can get discoloration from the urine uh, and you can get a smell in the urine. Um, we all know that 75% of the population have a horrible smell when they eat asparagus or they get bright red urine when they have beetroot. So be mindful of some of the things like oily fish and some of the antibiotics will come through into the urine and but that is perfectly normal. Can I swim? Yes, you can swim with or without the, uh, without the pouch on. Can I exercise? Yes, you've had a surgical uh, incision and therefore it's quite important that you that when you do exercise, that you are very mindful of, of the fact that you've had that incision in the abdomen. Sometimes you might have laparoscopic surgery or robotic surgery. Um, and so therefore the muscles that are, are uh, cut are probably not as badly affected, but it is always important to exercise but exercise within the remit of your previous surgery. Can I wear my usual clothes? Well, I think you'll, you'll see from the, uh, the lovely people talking after me that yes, you can wear normal clothes. And sometimes you might need a bit of adaptation where belts are concerned, but otherwise, yes, it's important to get back to normality. What can I eat or drink? I think you can eat or drink anything. Uh, anything that you could before. Always remember that alcohol um, is dehydrating. When you go on a plane, that's very dehydrating. So make sure that you have a good input, one and a half to two litres a day. Also remember that certain uh, drinks and foods can cause more mucus. So fizzy drinks can cause more mucus. Uh, real ale um, can cause more mucus. Um, and also um, having uh, uh, certain types of tummy upsets that can give you more mucus in the urine. Also, medications can colour the urine. Iron sometimes makes the urine dark and black. Um, but just be aware of what you're eating and have a think about, did I have beetroot yesterday? OK, I'm not bleeding. It's just beetroot. Will it hurt? There's a very poor nerve supply, but very good blood supply to the stoma. So essentially, it should not hurt. Will it show? Will it be obvious to others? No, it shouldn't be. 
what can go wrong? Well, no surgery is 100% risk free. And the surgeon will also explain to you, but generally this is a gold standard operation. Uh, it's been around since the 1950s, and there are very little uh, things that, very few things that go wrong these days. How will it affect my sex life? If you've had your surgery for bladder cancer, there will be some effects on your sex life, but it's very important that the medical staff, the nursing staff, and yourself talk about this and, and ask what can be done for the, for the issues. So there's never a silly, there's never a silly question. Um, you know, it shouldn't, at the end of the conversation that you have with your clinical nurse specialist and your surgeon, you should be able to say, yes, I actually understand this. If you don't understand it, please ask the questions. It's not your perception of what we said that's wrong. It's the way we've put it. And so therefore, just make sure that you understand exactly and what the operation entails. And also make sure that you take a list of questions along with you because everybody has very valid and important questions. So what do we want for outcome? We want everybody who comes to see us about the operation to state that at the end of it, they're satisfied with the information given. Booklets, information, taking notes, it's really, really important. Get the opportunity and we must give you the opportunity to ask further questions. And if you're having your surgery in a couple of weeks, you may need to phone up and ask a, question, a burning question that's been worrying you. We need you to be involved in choosing the stoma site. Let us know what sports and activities you do, whether you're a teacher that has to sit on little tiny chairs and therefore bending a lot in the middle. These are all important things when we're uh, we're, when we're actually citing you preoperatively. And we want you to be satisfied with that stoma site. And we want to make sure that all the ethical and psychological implications for you as an individual are covered. The Eurostomy Association was set up by Eurostomates for Eurostomates. And it's a very, uh, it's a, a very important uh, resource. Um, and it's currently going through a 50 year process. And please, anybody who wishes to contact Hazel, our CEO, uh, is very, very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sharon, for that excellent presentation. Um, after we have Susan and David speak, we'll also have a question and answer session. And I can already see some questions coming in through the inbox. If you have any questions um, for nurses um, or for patients, please put them in the question and answer box and we will get to them during the question and answer session. Now, it is my delight to welcome Susan Mullerworth. Uh, Susan Mullerworth is a bladder cancer patient advocate and is living with a stoma, and she will share with you her journey of bladder cancer and living with a stoma. Susan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you for the kind introduction. So I'm Susan Mullerworth. I'm a patient advocate, and um, I'm now five years on and living life to the full with my stoma. I named him Neil after my consultant. Um, yes, initially I was very angry um, and I had a love-hate relationship with Neil, but now I'm so grateful because he saved my life. With all changes, it takes time to adjust and don't forget you're already feeling quite poorly, so don't beat yourself up anymore. Keep positive and be assured that despite any setbacks, you will be able to eventually get back to leading a normal, active life. If you have a carer um, and they are happy to help, perhaps get them involved and perhaps get them involved in how to manage your day and your night routines. Their help initially will be invaluable. However, if you're alone, please be assured that you will be OK. At all times, you will have your stoma nurse who will support you. There's plenty of helplines on any of the supply sites where you can literally call up and ask if you've got any problems with any 
situations, um, you, you will make sure you've got a lot of help available. So I had questions about underwear, clothing, smell, stigma, intimacy, and you know, what about returning to work? What do I wear? And yes, of course, the big question is, how will I cope if it leaks? You'll work closely with your stoma nurse and approach fellow, I call them baggers, um, who will help you along your journey. There are many products to choose from and you must keep trying many samples. Um, you will eventually find one that fits your shape. Keep positive and you'll find that one. You'll work very closely with all the suppliers and you can get as many samples and try as many different shapes and sizes that you want. It took me probably, <clears throat> excuse me, it took me probably three months until I was comfortable um, with my actual supplier. And to be honest, I really haven't changed very much since then over the last five years um, because it's worked out well. I get very, very few leaks, but I know how to manage this. Um, I'll carry supplies on me. I've got them all around the place. You'll get very familiar with um, sighting where the toilets are. Um, you can carry a card that's got a no waiting, so you can jump the queue. Um, you can get special priority at airports. There's quite a few advantages, so, so keep positive about this. Now, I wear tight jeans, I swim, sauna, steam, and I walk for miles, and I've got a great deal of, of, of enjoy my active fun. Um, and that was just really the same as before, you know, before when I got Neil. Um, I travel a lot and I manage long haul flights. Again, it's just a little bit of preparation, working it out. And if needs be, you know, if you're on a long haul flight, you just tell the hostess and just say, look, you know, I need to be sighted to the toilet. Get an aisle seat. You'll work all this out. Um, you know, all these these little, little tips that you'll pick up. Fight Bladder Cancer UK have an excellent information booklet entitled um, Living with Stoma and getting used to your new normal. Um, I would like to say that um, we, we are a big family and always here to help. So good luck on your journey. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, if you have any questions um, for Susan or for Sharon, please pop them in the question box. Next, we have David Ritchie, another one of the Fight Bladder Cancer Patient Advocates, um, who will tell you his story about living with the stoma. David, the floor is yours. Hi, my name is David Ritchie and I've been living with my stoma since my bladder cancer surgery at the age of 51, two and a half years ago. I had never even heard of a stoma up until that point. And when I did first become aware of what it was, my reaction was, oh my goodness, no one would ever want such a thing. It's horrible, disgusting, embarrassing and awkward. At least, those were my initial thoughts. I was not even supposed to get one, as I adopted for a new bladder and had been ex accepted as suitable. My surgery was scheduled for the 1st of April 2020, just as the lockdown started. It went ahead, thankfully, but was changed to an ostomy due to COVID limitations in the hospital at the time. I guess I was just grateful to be being treated under the circumstances. Post-surgery took a bit of getting used to, unsurprisingly, but I was determined to make the most of it. Working out what kit I needed and what best suited me was key. There was a lot of trial and error, but I got there pretty quickly. For new members of the Stoma Club, being able to speak to someone with first-hand knowledge is invaluable to learn from their experience and I would thoroughly recommend that. I tend to wear my ostomy bag almost horizontally which means it sits above my waistline and to the side. It's held there with a ost an ostomy belt that I found on eBay. This really works for me and is the most comfortable solution. When I exercise, I use a body strap, probably designed for people with a hernia, but this is good at holding everything in place tightly. Two and a half years on, where well, life is pretty normal. My stoma is just part of me now, and it doesn't limit me very much at all. 
I've always enjoyed travelling and initially wondered how I would manage with that. However, already this year I have visited Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Greece and Italy. I have swam in the pools of our hotels and in the sea, and I have eaten out in countless restaurants. My ability to travel and enjoy different countries and experiences has not been impacted by my stoma. I have been a keen runner for many years and initially wondered if my running days were over with my stoma. Far from it. I have run both a half and full marathon this year and I am on target to run a total of a thousand kilometres in 2022. I don't feel the need to carry a kit bag around with me all the time, filled with ostomy accessories, but do appreciate that some people may want to do that. I have just not found it necessary. My overall message is that a stoma is a daunting prospect, but you do get used to having it, and you will adapt. It doesn't need to deteriorate your life in any way if you don't let it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got three questions so far. Um, one on how to protect the site, um, creams or powders. Another one about um, the possibility of using U drains at night to plumb directly into the house waste system. And then another question about um, how often people should be having checkups um, after their operation. Um, so Sharon um, and then Susan, um, what should people be using um, to protect their site? Um, can I answer that? Sure. Um, yep. uh, all the products that you use underneath the flange must be suitable for um, using underneath the stoma. So you're um, underneath the underneath the stoma flange. So using the products that are from the suppliers, it's very important to make sure that you don't sort of go down to Boots and buy. Uh, E45 cream because you're never going to get be able to get anything to stick. So all the products that the companies produce, these specific uh, manufacturers of stoma care products, have um, skin protection products, both powders, creams, lotions that are suitable for using underneath the stoma flange. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd also, yeah, I'd, I'd really emphasise that um, don't go all out using them if you actually have no need. If you get a little bit of irritation, again, your stoma nurse will provide you with something, some powder or whatever. Um, but again, um, you wouldn't use them regularly. It's only if you get a slight irritation. Yeah, I totally agree. And David, do you have anything to add to protecting your stoma site? I think I think we're just, David. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Yes. No. Okay. Um, so the next question is from Chris, um, and talk, Chris says that um, they have actually managed to use a U drain at night um, to plumb their bag directly into the house waste drain system. Um, Sharon and then Susan, what what are your thoughts on this? Um, it's not a product that I have personally ever used or recommended, um, but I know that. There are some people who find it very, very useful. Um, I would I would probably say that I'm a sort of person who, um, when I'm working with my patients, want them to have the simplest uh, system possible. And uh, and and I I think it's it's well worth looking into it. But I think for your average person, probably plugging into a night drainage bag if they need to or want to. And there's obviously a percentage of people who don't like to use either. Um, they all, they prefer to get up in the night and, and empty the bag. And, and particularly um, during intimacy, I, I think that uh, um, being connected to anything um, is probably not 
some people's uh, favourite choice. But, uh, you know, these products are available. They were, I believe this was designed by somebody who has a urinary stoma. So... Thank you, Sharon. Um, Susan, Susan yeah, what do you do at night time? Um, yes, yeah. So, so night time, uh, actually, because I, I used to suffer terribly with insomnia, but now I like to sleep. So for me, the obvious suggestion is um, la literally the last thing I do uh, with my bedtime routine is I connect and plug into my, my night bag. Um, it's peace of mind. I know it's just by my side and it will last me all night so I don't get any sleep disturbance which again helps me get better um you know and help, helps me keep my energy levels up because a good night's sleep is, is is worth a lot um I do know a few drains I did actually look into it because I thought you know what a great idea um you have to make sure you're sighted because it runs along I think your skirting board and then back outside to a drain um don't quote me too technical on this the only um situation is that obviously you can't take that with you if you're staying away um if you're traveling whatever you're doing staying at somebody else's you need to make sure that your other routine kicks in because obviously you can't take your you drain it is is purely for where you live so um again you experiment with with night bags there are a lot of people that just say i don't bother <clears throat> i know when the bag is filling up and I just get up, you know, I was used to getting up two or three times a night. Again, if you like your sleep, plug in. Um, I've never had a leaky bag. Um, you know, my night bag has been totally secure and, and well managed. Um, so, so yes, for me, that, that works. Thank you, Susan. And David, what do you do at night time? Sorry, David, we're still having some technical problems with you. Um, so we might move on to the next question. Um, so uh, the next question is about how many, uh, how often people should be getting checkups um, after their operations. Um, so Sharon, um, when someone has recently um, had um, an operation, so about 12 months ago, um, Anthony had their operation. Um, at the beginning how often are the follow-ups and then do they do they get longer after time so i'll ask sharon to talk about that and then susan maybe you can talk about now how often you have follow-up well i think i mean i i started off where we used to follow up everybody in outpatients in six weeks and then six months and then a year and then every year um and i I actually think it's really important to have that ability for follow up. But I, I do hear through the Eurospy Association that there is no um, parity between the country. Uh, di different GPs, different uh, hospitals have different follow up um, protocol. So I, I mean, I think sometimes you have to be quite proactive in in asking for your follow up. I think when you have the surgery for bladder cancer you are followed up much more routinely than you would be if you had it for benign surgery so I, th I think it's it's probably um also it's important to have a, a relationship with your stomach care nurse and you know i know in the unit that i work in that they are very proactive in in contacting the patients postoperatively so um it, it, i think it's it will vary from hospital to hospital but I think it's very important with the com combination of having surgery for post bladder cancer and and having the urostomy that you have more regular follow-ups and also a relationship with your GP that you can go along and say this is concerning me um, and uh, and the GP that follows up on that Thank you, Sharon. And Susan, what is your experience of follow up? Um, yes, again, um, if you feel you want to speak to somebody, then then be persistent. It's a bit of a motto. But originally um, I was followed up probably every 
two to three months. That was for the first year. Um, and then afterwards and now I'm on six monthly. Um, my diagnosis, my prognosis um, was 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 high grade and advanced. So, um, again, I can suffer quite a bit with anxiety. But what I always just say to people is if you are getting anxious or you're worried about your scan or you've got what we call scanxiety, then you make that call. You contact your nurse specialist um, or even you just try and get through to your consultant. Push for your appointments and push for your scans. You know, you, you, you have to use your voice. But um, I'm happy now. Um, I'm fine. Five years on, I will still remain on six monthly. And that's what my consultant suggested last time um, I spoke to him. Um, you know, one day uh, I might get pushed to a year. That will be a good a good progression um, and something to aim for. But, you know, it's peace of mind. Thank you, Susan. Um, so, David, do we have you back? Yes, um, hopefully you can hear me now. I've, yes. I, I've moved to a different location, so hopefully this is a bit better. Apologies again for that. Uh, David, how much follow-up do you have and how regular is it? So I have a, a six-monthly CT scan, and I think the plan is for that to continue for, for a five-year period, and then uh, we will uh, determine whether that period can be extended. But, yeah, that has gone um, fine to date. That's great. So thank you. Uh, the next we've got some more questions coming in, um, which is fantastic. So um, we've got two questions, one about how long it takes to return to normal and then some tips and tricks for swimming as well. So let's ask first, how long after a stoma operation does it take for life to return to normal playing sports and enjoying normal pastimes? I'll go Sharon, then Susan, then David. Sharon. Well, I think probably Susan and David can answer that better than me. Uh, I mean, I think it's really important to um, to emphasise how uh, exercise does uh, uh, make you feel better postoperatively. So um, I think I, I would I would always recommend that exercise and getting back to your hobbies and things that you did before. And even take on new hobbies are really important post-op. Motivation is extremely important. Thank you, Sharon. Susan, how long did it take you to get back to normal? Uh, <laughs> well, I think there's two normals here, sort of mentally and physically, um, because you've got it. You, you know, you have got a lot of challenges, but it's be positive all the way, and you know, make sure you've got your voice and your heard. So um, it took me three months until I got back to work. You have to consider driving, wearing the seatbelt, but you have to look at exactly what is your remit? What do you do? You know, if you're um, a rugby player, um, then you have to look at when you can actually go back to active playing, okay? Your team um, will help help you along with this. And again, your, your, your nurse will help you along with this. Um, I would say after three months when I went back to work, um, I was beginning to feel quite normal, less conscious, obviously. Um, I didn't change very much with what I wore before or what I wore afterwards. I, I just adapted. Exercise is paramount. You start off with walking. If you can do a little bit of um, yoga, um, you can find that on YouTube. There are some very sort of gentle yogas that you can do. Um, um, and just keep an eye that you don't do anything strenuous. You will know, you know, you will know if that hurts or if it feels you've done too much. But you can actually get back to all the things that you did before. Um, we've got some amazing people that we often speak to that have skydived, um, rugby players, whatever it is, you know, they they actually do it. Thank you, Susan. And David, how long did it take you to get back to uh, the new normal? And also, can you tell us about your horizontal bag? Yeah, yeah. OK, so let me uh, let me start with that then. So I, I thought this was was uh, probably quite interesting for, for people. Um, when you see a lot of the illustrations of uh, your ostomy pouches, they tend to sit vertically and uh, you know, I did try that initially, but I, I found that 
wearing it almost horizontally and having this little um, belt that I, I bought from um, eBay is actually a very comfortable solution for me. The whole thing sits above my uh, my belt on, on my trousers, so actually it doesn't impact anything below that uh, at all. I couldn't actually imagine having the, the bag, um, you know, breaching my, my waistline. I think that would be very uncomfortable. So it kind of sits above and I, and because it's sitting horizontally, it's, uh, you know, is uh, as comfortable as, as these things can be. In terms of uh, the, the question around um, exercise, well, pre um, all of this experience, I was uh, a, a keen runner and I, I, I really did think, um, you know, will I be able to return to running um, post uh, post op operation and, and post having a, a stoma? Well, the reality was that seven weeks after my operation, I ran a 10k um, and I had built up to that. I, and, uh, but but managed that reasonably well in, in uh, after seven weeks. And, and I'm now two and a half years uh, into uh, the, the new normal. Um, 2022, my running is really back to what it was prior to uh, me having uh, my uh, operation. Um, I, I've run both a half marathon and a full marathon this year. And I am on target to run a um, thousand kilometres in, in 22, 2022. So, you know, I think from a, a, a capability perspective, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much back to where I was. Uh, and the stoma hasn't really impacted me at all. The, when I run, um, I actually, I don't, the, the bag that I described there that holds the, uh, the, or sorry, the belt that holds the bike horizontally. I don't actually wear that. I wear um, what is more like a kind of hernia uh, strap that kind of holds everything really tightly uh, around my tummy, and that's perfect for running. And it, it, it doesn't move at all, and I, it, I, I just I participate in the events in, in exactly the way that I did uh, previously. And I think swimming is the other thing. You know, I I I was very keen to to travel with my family and and friends uh, pre uh, all of this. And again, I kind of thought, you know, will will I be limited in what I can do there? Well, I can tell you, I've caught up really well this year, having had the um, uh, you know the, the uh, experience that we all did over a uh, lockdown where we couldn't travel. I've been travelling like crazy this year. I've been all over the place: um, Ireland, Spain, Italy, Greece, Portugal, um, all of these places. And I've, uh, I've I've been able to swim both in the hotels that we've stayed in, the pools and the hotels, and in the sea, um, and enjoyed everything that I did previously um, from a holidaying perspective. I, uh, the, you know, the, the idea of carrying a bag about with me with all the uh, Austin-y accessories um, just in case. Well, I don't actually do that. I'm really quite relaxed about the whole thing. And I do respect that some people will want to do that, but I don't find it necessary, um, and you know I, I have a, a spare bag in my car um, just in case I need it. But I certainly don't, you know, carry a whole load of stuff about with me. Um, so I think I probably answered more than I the, the question there. But thank you, David. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so yes, you you touched on swimming here. So Susan, have you been swimming, and would you have any tips or tricks for? other people with stomas who would like to go swimming? Um, yes, you go swimming. Um, it was one of the things I was desperate to get back to. I swam a lot before and I've swam, I think, even further since I've had the stoma. So um, in terms of I have seen people wearing bikinis. 
and wearing their stoma outside. It's a rarity, but I just wear a one piece swimsuit that's well fitted. It's a bit ruched around the, the belly, um, so that covers anything. Um, I swim with the bag on um, and it's waterproof. It's it's fine. It's never, ever come off or unstuck. Um, what I then would tend to do is if I want to nip into the changing rooms and I've even been in changing rooms when there isn't a, a, a cubicle that you can go into. So, you know, just literally with a robe or a towel around you and add a sink, you can then change or do your normal routine. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You won't feel embarrassed you'll feel actually quite proud of, of of what you've done so it is all achievable thank you susan oh i'll just um, add you can you can sauna yes. and steam as well you can sauna and steam and it's very safe that's wonderful that's wonderful uh we've had a question as well sharon about how to decide between a stoma and a neobladder you spoke very briefly about the three different options that people have um, when people come to you, Sharon, and they say, should I have a stoma or should I have a neobladder? Um, what are the best ways of finding out about your options and what's best for them? Well, I think, first of all, the, the three options have to be available um, where you are actually having your surgery done. Um, using uh, information from Fight Bladder Cancer, from Eurostomy Association, from Mitrofenov Support, you can access on the internet lots and uh, lots of information about all three types of the operations. And it's important when you you go along to see your clinical nurse specialist that you, if you if you feel that you would like one operation over another, that you actually have the opportunity to ask them whether this is done in your particular unit. Um, I think David mentioned that you know he he had his surgery um, during or round about lockdown, um, and I think that that did for some units limit uh, the options available. But I I, I think it's um, it's very important with each of the operations that you you are given from your nurse specialist. The, the pros and cons of, of the particular operations. And different people choose different operations for different reasons. Um, and so it's, it's whether, but the, I suppose the, the thing I think is most important is, do we do many in our unit? If we don't do many in our unit, can I be transferred to another unit that, that actually does them? Um, and, and, and particularly bearing in mind the reason that you're having them done in the first place, I think it's incre incredibly important to uh, that there's a, a reasonable time frame between you being told you require that surgery and actually receiving that surgery. So there's there's lots of lots of questions uh, to ask. Um, preoperatively uh, but there is now quite a lot of uh, information um, and I know that fight bladder cancer have all three options mentioned in in their literature um, but also as I say pushing the uh, the U UA and mitro support we're really happy to to talk to anybody who's preoperatively uh, who's preoperative so um, yeah Questions, questions, questions. It's really important. Thank you, Sharon. And yes, White Bladder Cancer is happy to offer a bladder buddy service as well, where people can talk to someone who's had a near bladder and talk to someone who's had a stoma as well and get their patient to perspective. So we've got another question about flights. So I'll ask Susan and then David, could you quickly walk us through what is it like to go to an airport, go through security and hop on a flight with a stoma? OK, so um, a couple of things I, I, I suggest is that there is some paperwork you can carry with you. Um, so if you're questioned or if you bleep when you go through any security, there's a little booklet and it's got, um, gosh, about 10 languages inside. And it just basically says um, 
I've got a stoma and it, it, it tells people. So I had that booklet. I, I keep it in my passport. So I, I had that ready um, as soon as I, I start going through security. You are allowed to take on an extra bag. So if you've got any sprays or anything medical, you are allowed actually two of these clear plastic bags. Um, so you don't have to feel you've got to ram all your supplies plus your makeup into just one bag. So be aware of that. And again, if you've got your little travel card, that is good as well. So um, in terms of going through security, if you do bleep um, and you haven't made anybody aware, when I go through and I'm like that, um, they run the um, whatever it is detector over me. And I just say I pat it on the right hand side and I just say, look, I've got a stoma here. Um, it depends what reception you get. Somebody might grunt at you. Somebody might might smile and say, oh, you know, sorry to hear that, man. But uh, whatever. When you get on the plane. OK, just make sure um, as what I do, you, you, you make sure you know where the toilets are before you board. And then when you get on the plane, if the plane is delayed or if you are, are there and you need to use the toilet, then you just make an attendant aware. Always book an aisle seat so that you um, don't disturb anybody. If it's long haul flight, OK, you're just going to go to the toilet a few times. At one time I did plug in a night bag um, because I thought that was a done thing, you know, um, eight or nine hour flight. That would be easy. But with hindsight, no. You know, um, you can set little alarms. You can put an alarm on your phone to say, you know, two to three hours or two hours, I'll, I'll get up and go to the toilet. Um, you will manage it. Um, get a radar key. A radar key is available so that you have the key to 10,000 toilets in the UK. Um, if you're at train stations and traveling, all the big London stations, they they um, um, have a special disabled toilet. And you can use that with your radar key. They're uh, available from, I think, the Ostomy Association. But if you Google radar key, you can get hold of one of those. Um, anything else for traveling long haul? You'll be fine. It's achievable. Do it. Great. Thank you, Susan. Uh, David, we have one minute left in our question and answer session. So um, what tips do you have for people flying? OK, so I think just I doesn't hit the nail on the head. You, you, you just do it. I've been on more than a dozen flights this year. I've never been stopped at security. I've never had any issue whatsoever. Um, I visit the, the loo when I need to, but I was doing that anyway. Um, so uh, it, it really hasn't been any different for me. Uh, to, to fly and to, to travel and I've enjoyed it and I'm going to do the same again next year. So thank you, David. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Sharon, um, for answering all of the questions. We weren't able to get through them all. Um, so feel free to email info at eurostomyassociation.org.uk or info at fightbladdercancer.org.uk. And uh, we'd be very happy to answer your questions there. Uh, you can also watch a recording of this video later. So don't, if you've been taking frantic notes, you can watch the recording. There are also plenty of other resources uh, that Fight Bladder Cancer has available. We have a website uh, in clear language that clearly steps you through all the areas of a bladder cancer journey. We have our Fight magazine as well. We post this to free uh, for free anywhere in the UK. It's also available freely download uh, on our website. And we also have monthly Zoom support groups as well, where we bring together the British bladder cancer community, everyone who is affected by bladder cancer. And we have various chats from medical specialists as well as friendly catch ups. Uh, we also have these two patient information booklets as well as an entire suite of patient information booklets. We have living with a neobladder and living with a stoma. You can get these from your nurse. You can download these from our website and you can also email us at info at fibladdercancer.co.uk and we would be delighted to send them to you. So we have uh, here are our resources and our contact details. So you can find us at fightbladdercancer.co.uk. You can contact us at info at fightbladdercancer.co.uk. Uh, and then you can also follow us on social media. Uh, you should also have some polls coming up now. So we'd really uh, be interested in your feedback uh, on this webinar as well. So how much of this information was 
new to you? Are there any aspects of Estoma that you would like to learn more about? What other topics would you like to attend a webinar on? How did you hear about this webinar? And rate your overall experience as well, because your feedback is vital because this webinar is for you. So yes, please follow us on Twitter at Fight Bladder Cancer, at Bladder Cancer UK. Follow us on Facebook. We also have an Instagram and a LinkedIn account. So thank you very much um, for all your time. A huge, huge thank you to Sharon, Susan and David for sharing their perspectives. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you from all of us at Five Bladder Cancer.